We're in the TechCrunch studio today with Patrick Collison, who's CEO and co-founder of Stripe. Patrick, welcome to the studio. It's great to be here. So I'd like to talk about something related to Stripe, but a little bit different, which is you're, you're a young CEO, fa helped found the company, technical co-founder, and I think it'd be really great for the audience for you to share a little bit about how you're trying to turn, you know, how you're becoming CEO, and specifically the management piece of it, right? Because a lot of what you're going on is intuition. You're not trained in management. You don't have management experience. And I think you've made really interesting decisions. Yeah, I think I think we've been a little bit, um, I guess, like, like like most companies that sort of turn out OK, yeah, we've been lucky. Um, and mm -hmm. for Stripe in particular, I, I think of the first 10 people or so, eight had previously started companies, uh, including myself and John. This is, this is now our second company. And I think because of that, sort of a lot of the early people at Stripe really had sort of a good sort of self-discipline and, and kind of ability to self-manage and to sort of handle themselves and sort of be comfortable in situations where, I mean, it's the early days of a startup, so there's, there's a lot of uncertainty. And so I think sort of that initial kind of disposition in people was, was sort of pretty helpful and meant we sort of had some time to figure out mm -hmm. uh, how we should structure ourselves and how we should coordinate. And then sort of over time, I guess we've, that's, that's now sort of started to become something that we we feel pretty good about, and we've really tried to sort of be careful about the the management structures that we put in place. And so, I guess for me as a, um, I guess a, a CEO, uh, you know, we we're, we're now a, almost a forty person company, but we're trying to sort of be be a little bit different um, as compared to to most companies in terms of mm. the structure we put in place. And in particular, we really want to preserve as much of the autonomy as possible um, in that. People tend to like startups um, because, I mean, there's small teams and so much flexibility and you don't sort of constantly have sort of somebody, somebody breathing down your neck. And, you know, it's not that we think that, um, obviously as a, as a company grows, um, th th things change somewhat, right? Uh, and it's not that sort of we think that we can be a 500-person company or a 1,000-person company with no, with no coordination or something. But, you know, it's, it's a balance. And I think as technology improves and as we learn more about sort of what works and what doesn't, there's, there's scope to do things better. And so uh, it's, it's been interesting so far. So, at, so now, you know, you've started the second company, have mm -hmm. some experience to draw from. How do, you go and, how do you go and learn some of these management techniques, right? And, and thinking through the structure of how you want to structure your company in terms of personnel. Right. Right. Is it, do you, do you read books? Do you, do you lean on advisors really strongly or do you talk to other founders? Like what's your formula for figuring that out? Uh, I certainly can't claim to have figured it out yet, yeah. uh, but the formula so far has been certainly some amount of reading and I mean it's not just kind of traditional management books, whatever, but yeah. pe people have blogged about this or like written core yeah. answers or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Um, part of what's really nice about the Valley, and I think, uh, I mean, there's some, there are some parts of the Valley that are bad, right, in that you know, people are sort of uh, I inwards looking maybe sometimes or hype driven or whatever, but part of what's really good is that people are so helpful and there's such, such a kind of ready network of people around you who are just like very willing to sort of to, to advise you. You can yeah. almost like cold email them and they'll sort of happily yeah. uh, help out as much as you want. And folks like, I, don't, uh, I think, uh, Nat Friedman at Xamarin is uh, is like uh, a really underrated founder and has been like massively helpful for us. Mm. Aaron Levy at Box has like always been really generous with his time. And obviously, he's building like a really incredible company there. Um, Adam Goldstein at Hipmonk, you know, they're, they're they sort of started at a similar size, or excuse me, a similar time to Stripe, and so we've been able to sort of compare notes yeah. along the way. Yeah. So th th there's been all of that, but then honestly, there's just been a lot of debate and discussion internally at Stripe as to, as to how we want to structure ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. And again, it's going back to sort of this, this aspect where people have worked at startups before, and I mean, in many cases, they've worked at large companies before, and it, we're, we're sort of, we're not coming to this entirely anew thinking, man, how could you possibly you know, structure a company? Yeah. You know, we, we've seen things and people have sort of opinions as to what works well and what doesn't. And I, I guess to give a tangible example, uh, Shrika Chakrabarti was uh, Stripe's uh, the, the fifth person to, to join Stripe, including myself and John, um, the third employee. Yeah. Um, and he'd pre previously worked at a, at a hedge fund, Bridgewater. And Bridgewater has this sort of really interesting philosophy where it's sort of very oriented, or oriented around kind of robust discussion and I mean, kind of specific sort of factual disagreement, but sort of not being, af not being afraid to disagree where there is in fact disagreement. And you know, he, he'd seen that up close and, and thought that it, it worked pretty well in a lot of ways. Yeah. And so 
it's, it's been a combination of all Got those it. things. And so I think specifically, it'd be it'd be great to drill into a little bit some of the the management decisions you made in terms of personnel. Because one thing I do see with startups sometimes is that they'll there there's this mode to kind of stay lean and you want to preserve cash and you want to preserve culture and you know, if you really, d if as a CEO and the founders look out ahead of time, there are things that are going to pop up where they say, we need somebody to own that. Yeah. And what I think is interesting, what you've done is you've actually gone out and hired for those people ahead of time. And I usually see startups hire people just in time, or as mm -hmm. you mentioned earlier, a little bit too late. I mean, right. I think it'd be really helpful for founders out there listening to understand how you went through that thought process about hiring people before you needed them. Sure, sure. Yeah, so... I guess with Stripe, uh, I guess we were all sort of very acutely conscious of how we're not just sort of a product company or like a traditional sort of pure technology company. We also operate in like a fairly complex kind of finance world and there are regulatory concerns and compliance issues and just it, it, it's a fairly sort of subtle industry. And I guess, you know, I, I sort of figured from a, from a pretty early stage that I mean I'm, I'm really interested in and I, I guess I have some experience with sort of programming and technology and products and everything else but I mean I don't have a ton of, of finance experience or even experience with sort of dealing with um, with highly regulated industries or where there's sort of these large incumbents that really control a lot of it and so I guess we were very aware of this and we were just really lucky where uh, we got introduced to Billy Alvarado um, who had had been a co-founder of Lala, had previously worked in finance, had, um, uh, had had dealt with telecoms at a previous company, and so just had a lot of experience sort of both being at a startup and sort of operating in that environment, but also working in, in these, the, these, navigating these complicated waters. And as soon as we were in, introduced to Billy and sort of started to, to have these kind of these conversations and discuss where Stripe was headed and sort of what it would take to get there, it was really clear that there was just, there was a good fit. And so, you know, at the at the time, even it wasn't clear to us that, like, uh, b before he joined, it wasn't totally obvious to us that it was sort of enough for him to do kind of right then. And like, we knew we really, we really liked him, and that sort of over mm -hmm. time, tribe would have enough for him to do. But we weren't sure. Mm. And then, of course, he joined, and like immediately, there was like too much for him to do, and we, we could have had yeah. two Billies. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so then, once we had that experience, we were sort of. I don't know, maybe a little bit emboldened or whatever. Yeah, and yeah. so the, the next kind of obvious function was around legal and compliance and whatever. Mm -hmm. And so, again, it was just sort of fortuitous where there was this guy, John Zeger, who had spent a long time at Microsoft and sort of dealt a lot with the internet arm at Microsoft. And so things like the internationalization of, and the kind of international rollout of Bing and, I mean, things that aren't a million miles from Stripe, right? I mean, they we're taking this product in the U.S. and we're going to bring it elsewhere. And again, he's just like this, this incredibly strong lawyer and sort of really got what Stripe was doing. And we're, yeah. again, we have the question, well, obviously Stripe will need that at some point. Sort of, is, is it the right thing for us right now? Well, you know, we, we should just go for it. Uh, yeah. and, and again, sort of as soon as he joined, it was very clear that you know, two John Zegers would have So been what, great. Do you, what do you think it is? I mean, let's, it's dangerous to generalize, but just in general, what do you think it is about a founder? I mean, clearly you guys are... We're, we're hitting some traction at some point. Yeah. So let's let's not include people who are who are before that time. Sure. But what do you think it is about founders where they're a little reluctant to hire? Is it sort of memory of a bad hire or bringing someone on where there's not much to do right away? Or wh what do you think that piece of resistance is? Yeah, I mean, certainly you never want to over hire, right? Yeah. Um, and sort of the last thing anybody wants is you sort of have this built out executive team and sort of no, no business to, to sustain it. Yeah. I guess. With these hires, we were we were really sure, or, or I guess we really believed that there just there wasn't all that much. Um, the business wasn't that interesting unless we unless we kind of were doing a really good job with these roles, right? In that, like you can't really imagine Stripe without like a really good API or a really good documentation or something like that. That's sort of like just a prereq prerequisite to even exist. Yeah. But I think part of the reason why this problem has not been solved before is that I mean, you can't just excel at those things. You have to also do a really good job with the legal side of things, or you need to convince really strong banking partners to work with you. Yeah. And so it was not so much that we thought this was sort of something that we'd need strictly as we'd grow, but it was, it was, some amount was just table stakes, right? That we just, 
in the same way that from day one you'd love to have like a strong back-end engineer or designer or whatever it is, yeah. we thought that like from the earliest stages of Stripe, Got we it. should have sort of a really strong legal mind and business mind and, and whatever else. And so, you know, can you generalize that to other, other startups? I mean, maybe if you're a more if you're kind of a more traditional or pure technology play, yeah. then then I, th I think it's a harder question as to when yeah. you start to hire those people. But for Stripe, it was I guess we looked at our first lawyer like like we looked at our first designer. Uh, interesting. So now let's shift gears a little bit, and we, we have been talking a little bit about you know Stripe is a company that's building tools for developers and site you know to to build out their websites. Yeah. And generally, just this theme of people building things for developers. Yes. Right? And there's there's some, con not controversy, but mm -hmm. difference of opinion in, in the investment market about there's a class of people who think they're very bullish about this, yeah. and there's the GitHub phenomenon. And right. A lot of companies under the radar forming, I almost think every week around this. Yeah. And then there are a bunch of people on the other side who said, I've seen this before. If you're lucky, you'll get to Adobe scale, and you'll have to package services around it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'd just be curious as someone who's in that space building um, you know, in a specific corner of sure. it. Sure. How do you view you know b building for developers as a market? Yeah. So. So I, I think looking at it, sort of building for developers specifically, isn't, isn't sort of exactly the right lens. I think okay. that it's. Um, uh, I think what's interesting about these companies is they're just being very clear about about who the users are, right? And it's not that sort of. Um, uh, like authorized.net, for example, which is one of these like legacy payment systems that existed before Stripe. Like they they too were building for developers. They just didn't really recognize it and they didn't know it. Uh, mm -hmm. But like developers were their users. They were the people there, sort of like building the software, writing the code, yeah. integrating it, whatever. Um, and I think I think building for developers is just kind of a particular sort of. Um, refraction of this general trend of the consumerization of the enterprise. And like the consumerization consumerization of the enterprise is kind of such an, an overused term now that people kind of I don't know their, their eyes roll when you hear it. But like at its core what it means is you're you're building for the users. You're building really good products. You're not building for the procurement officer, the CIO or whoever. And so in exactly the same way that I mean if you talked about box for example, you know, uh, you wouldn't say that Box is just like this little niche or sort of some some minority product. I mean, Box is just like the, the, they're trying to build a good product to solve the, this problem of file sharing. And I think that in in exactly the same way, um, anyone who's who's targeting developers is just recognizing who the user is and building a great product for them. And I mean, to, to, so developers specifically are building that category of users. I mean, I just I guess I don't see the argument as to how that could possibly be small. I mean, AWS is built for developers, and yeah. Netflix and Zynga is hosted on it, right? I mean, yeah. I guess the people would say against that that the margins are very thin. Um, you know, in terms of in terms of a venture scale business, right? But I think it's also interesting. You have I, I mean, Amazon's margins are pretty thin, right? I think it's yeah. pretty pretty early days to be uh, to be rendering judgment on these. Sure, sure, sure. Okay, great. Well, thanks for coming in and sharing your thoughts, and congrats on all your success. Not all. Thank you very much. Awesome.